Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the PCHD EMS podcast. I'm here with our medical director, Dr. Northheim, our deputy director, Chris Briggs, and one of our other supervisors, John Wheeler, also the lead instructor of the difficult airway uh, class, difficult airway course they've been teaching here at PCHD and uh, soon to be other places. So Dr. Northheim, why don't you start us off? Yeah, so I kind of wanted to talk about, I know it's a hot topic currently, um, but you know, for the last 10 years, we've really been focusing on cardiac arrest care and staying on scene and optimizing the patients and doing quality compressions and really not running to the hospital with these patients. And I think this has been very beneficial to our um, survival rates across our system. And so the other point is, once we get ROSC on these patients, when is the highest chance that these patients are going to re-arrest? And it's probably on the way to the truck during the movement. So, you know, keeping your Lucas, turn it off, but obviously leave it in place in case the patient recodes, but trying to optimize your patients, trying to work on making sure you have good access, fluids, um, push dose pressors if you need it, really make sure your tube's secured before you move these patients. Because, um, you know, if we've worked so hard to get ROSC on a cardiac arrest patient and then this patient codes on the way to the truck, now we're not in a great position um, to kind of restart that um, uh, care, especially if you're coming out of a grocery store or a second story apartment building or a nursing home. So that's one thing I think we've done a better job in just realizing across our system that diesel isn't what saves lives. And I think that was kind of an old school mentality of let's get in the truck, let's get in the hospital and the hospital is going to save these patients. And especially in cardiac arrest care, we know that 99% of the patients that walk out of the hospital from cardiac arrest are actually resuscitate and have a pulse prior to coming to the hospital. And only, you know, if you get there and you don't have a pulse to the hospital, we only about a 1% chance as ER uh, physicians. So we're trying to get out of that mentality on cardiac arrest, but I think we have to broaden it to all of our high acuity calls. You know, you run on a patient where you go into a doctor's office and their blood pressure is in the 70 range, instead of saying, hey, let's get you the cot and get you out to the, to the medic. Why don't we get the IV, start some fluids, maybe push dose pressors if we need to. Someone's hypoxic, let's try to optimize their saturations in the house or in the store or in the apartment building. And so we're really going to focus on that with the new protocol revision. And I think there's been some others that have, have spoken about this recently. But I think it's important, that, especially if you're in an aggressive EMS system like we are here at PCHD, would be we have a lot of these tools. We have ultrasound. We have blood products. We have um, pressors. We have drips. Um, we have IOs. We have video scopes. And so let's try to focus on this uh, before we move the patient. So um, I just run into on, on paramedic checkoffs sometimes where I say, oh, here's the vitals. And, and all of a sudden, the person who's checking out says, okay, cool, let's get to the truck. This patient's sick. And I think we need to focus on, on optimization. So one of our other medics within our system, Chris Muscle, always says, who determines where to intubate the patient? And ultimately, the patient does, right? And so Wheeler will talk about in a few minutes, you know, uh, oxygenating uh, our RSI patients, really building up their blood pressure. But I, I would make the argument on all patients um, we should be working on hopefully trying to get their O2 sats up above 94, trying to get their blood pressure above 90 before we move these patients. And, and I'm hoping with that, that we can come back and, and really look at our numbers later and, and find a lower percentage of our patients arresting in our care. And if you look at the CARES data really throughout the country, and we're no different throughout our system, it's about a 12% arrest in front of um, first responders. And so what does that mean? That probably means that our patients are sick we're probably not optimizing them enough. And then 12% of our patients are arresting. So can we prevent that? Can we drive that number down? And I'm hoping by um, changing some of our protocols that we'll be able to do that. A lot of people will say, well, what about the time sensitive things like STEMI and stroke and sepsis? I mean, as an ER physician, I can't do anything with those patients if they're hypotensive, right? If they're unstable, they're not going to go to cath lab if they're unstable. A lot of our strokes are typically not hypotensive, right? But oxygenating these patients, driving their blood pressure to, to a goal that's uh, sustainable for their vital organs, and really making sure that once you arrive to the emergency department, the patient's stabilized enough to go to cath lab, stabilized enough to go to CT or go to the neuro IR suite. And, and we know with sepsis that antibiotics and fluids are we're going to help these patients and a lot of our agencies are are doing that we're doing a great job with with fluid administration we're doing also carrying pre-hospital antibiotics which we're doing we're starting a lot of that care in the field and we just had one of our agencies um, find that antibiotics were being started when you compare the agency carrying pre-hospital antibiotics versus an agency not about an hour sooner 
And I would argue that um, depending on the hospital, and that's that's going to a hospital that has very pro-sepsis, very low sepsis mortality numbers. Um, we're talking about wall times. We're talking about other hospitals that may not be aggressive with sepsis care. You know, that number could drive up to the two to four hour window, right? Um, and so that's some of the things that I think we're realizing uh, within our system. I think an important thing is throughout my career, I've, I've consulted on different legal cases. And, and I think the common thread that I'm seeing is people seeing sick patients and then moving the patient and not really optimizing, whether it's just throwing O's on a patient, whether it's getting a line earlier and starting your fluid bolus. Um, I think that um, has impacted a, a lot of patients' care. And so that's our focus, um, especially for this year. I know some other agencies are talking about it. I know it's kind of a to hot topic, at least in the Metroplex right now, but that's where we'll be going. And so I think it's important for everyone to start discussing it and making sure your protocols kind of fit that mentality. So uh, one thing that, that I discovered over the last couple of years is like, is there's, a, there's that urge to get in the truck, you know, like I've got a sick patient, they're dying from whatever, semi stroke, sepsis, whatever it is. Um, understanding what the hospital needed to have before they could administer that life-saving treatment. Like if it's TPA, they're not going to give that unless the blood pressure is beneath 180 systolic, right? Yeah, 180, 185. Yeah. So for me, that was like, okay, I actually need to manage this person's pressure a little bit, potentially. Um, same thing with a STEMI. They're not going to go to a cath lab if somebody's peri-arrest. I've watched that happen. You think, oh, sweet, I got them to the ER and they haven't coded yet. And then you watch them code in the ER and it's like, what, what happened? Well, you dropped them off with a 60 over 40. They can't move that person because they're peri-arrest. Like getting them just to the ER without achieving those numbers. So I don't, I mean, I don't know if you have concrete numbers yet in the protocol for, for what we need to have before we start moving these people. So, yeah, so we're looking at 94% oxygen saturation uh, greater than or equal to, and then we're looking for a blood pressure um, greater than or equal to 90 as a starting point. Obviously, if you pull up on a, on a motor vehicle accident and you're right next to your truck, uh, get, yeah. get to the safety, get in there. If someone's in their front yard and you pull up, but we're talking about, you know, patients that are, you know, um, at the airport, at Seagates, and you're at C30, and your truck's at C1. I mean, it would be better to have that patient optimized at C30 and then walk through the airport with that patient um, stabilized. Or nursing homes we go to all the time with these long hallways, and you have unstable patient. I really don't want to be taking care of that patient halfway on the way to the truck when something bad happens. I'd rather have my crew there uh, and get them optimized. Obviously, safety, if safety is a concern, we have to do what we have to do. Um, but for majority of these calls, I think just focusing on that. And if you talk about a stroke, I mean, if, if a stroke has an unstable airway, I'm gonna have to get the airway in the ER. So there's either gonna be a delay in the field or there's gonna be a delay in the emergency department trying to get this patient to where we need to get them. So um, it's, it's kind of a, a paradigm shift, I think, for a lot of EMS providers. It's something we see all the time and it's something we really have to kind of hit the panic button and say, hey, let's, let's get this IV here. I mean, we took care of a patient the other day that was hyperkalemic with a pressure in the 70s with was bradycardic in the 30s in a doctor's office. And we gave two rounds of calcium uh, gluconate, two rounds of bicarb, had albuterol going on this patient, had fluids going on this patient, had two lines on this patient, and then waited to get to the truck. And we actually did an epoch chem in the truck. But this patient... His heart rate by the time we got to the truck was in the 60s. The pressure was optimized. We could have just said, man, this patient's sick, let's go. What would have happened to that patient coming out of the doctor's office where it would have taken 40 to 50 steps and having mm -hmm. them potentially stand up or lift them? I don't know. Yeah. So I think I think we're doing a good job focusing on that. We just have to educate, um, you know, obviously the rest of the departments and agencies and medical control to focus on that. Yeah, and I think understanding what the, what the care that they're going to get at the next hospital or the hospital is. Like understanding, hey, um, you know, yes, they need a cath lab. Yes, they need, you know, repeat labs, art lines, stuff like that. But uh, we can do almost everything that they can do in the back of the truck, and especially now with EPOC. Like, we really can do almost everything. So. Yeah, it doesn't mean you shouldn't activate the STEMI early, sure. get the cath team coming in. But, you know, whether you're going to get the patient optimized in the ED or optimized with your crew. And, and if your crew is solid and your crew has all the tools to get that patient optimized, um, you know, especially here, I know that we'd rather get the, the intubation and get the tube secured because, um, you know, we know there will be a delay um, in the emergency department getting that done. So let's just get it done. Let's make it easier. So that's a pretty good topic about patient optimization because that's really where we were getting it wrong years ago here. You know, pre-ox was a big deal, but patient optimization really wasn't there yet like it has been over the last five years. And so one thing we were getting wrong as an agency is, you know, not staying and playing. We were just taking off. Um, so, like, just for an example, Taylor and Brooks calling that post-cardiac arrest, 
you know, you that. see them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what you what you don't see on that call or the video that uh, that's been put out is the RSI portion, which I was super proud of, because they give several doses of push dose epi. They start them on an epi drip before they even move the patient. Right, you don't do any of that, and that patient dies before we even get them to the truck. Um, and it also optimizes for RSI. So we're doing a lot better job, you know, optimizing patients' blood pressure. Uh, there's really good literature that says you intubate anybody with a systolic of 90 or 100, there's a 5 to 6% chance that they're going to go into peri-intubation cardiac arrest. So I've definitely seen a huge improvement in our system with optimizing before we move them. Okay. So. And you just sent out a message just this morning to everybody talking about shock index. I mean, I'm not excited <laughs> about having to do math before I intubate somebody. but Yeah, so this particular patient, right, you look at the vital signs and they look great. Um, well, not great, but they, they look good and something that you probably wouldn't think about. The heart rate was 111, the systolic pressure is 130, you know, and they're worried about airway and they're pre-oxing perfectly. Um, and then they intubate and then the blood pressure drops down to 90, right? So that's a negative impact on your DASH 1A scores, right? Um, but if you do the shock index calculation, it comes out to 0.86. And so it kind of sh it should have prompted the crew to resuscitate. Right, give those two liters of fluid, or maybe get your push dose pressors out, your push dose leave a fed uh, to prevent that. So, something that we're working on and optimizing blood pressures. Okay, and a normal shock index is 0 0.7? Point, point 0.5 to point 0.6. Okay. So, anything greater than point 0.7 should kind of clue you in. Uh, anything greater than one is a critical shock state. Okay. So. Gotcha. All right, that's good to know. Yeah. I think we got a ways to go with public education too on our scene times. Because same thing with the physician's office. They sit and they look at you like, why are you here? What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of, we created that monster ourselves. And uh, yeah. a lot, long way to go. So Wheeler, can you go over, so I think pre-oxygenation, nitrogen washout is a hot topic. We've been doing it for a while. I'm not sure yeah. everyone completely understands it. At least in our system, unless it's a CPR, um, we're doing a few things um, that difficult airway preaches, which mm -hmm. would be, you know, ear to sternal notch positioning, elevating the head, right, mm -hmm. which keeps all the gastric contents down. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've intubated laying, laying flat, right? We always yeah. brought them down. A lot of gastric contents come up. Um, I think you really push that unless it's a CPR, every single patient is getting either adult or pediatric nasal cannula up to 15 liters per minute. Yeah. Um, and the, the most common thing I see um, in cases if someone's unresponsive, but yet they're ventilating at 14 to 16 a minute, we're immediately going to bagging, right? And so I think of a, a BVM as oxygenation coming in, and then the ventilation would be squeezing the bag. And we all know that pushing positive pressure into someone's stomach yeah. has poor um, outcome, high aspiration risks, um, lots of nasty stuff coming up through the stomach when we finally get the patient paralyzed and ready to intubate. And so our, our goal throughout our system now is every single person gets a normal nasal cannula up to 15, if they are ventilating, they're gonna get a non-rebreather. You can certainly move to CPAP, right, during that mm -hmm. kind of DSI process if you need to. If you have to ventilate them would be somebody agonal, right, then obviously you're gonna to have to do what you gotta do. But even with those patients, we're still doing nasal cannula. I think it's important for everyone to know that a capnography nasal cannula, you could turn up to 25, it is only going to give you six liters, yeah. right? And so um, it, I think everyone needs to do that better. You also, with your CPAP or BiPAP, can not only throw your capnography on to get your capnography readings, but you can do a nasal cannula, flush it to 15, and put your CPAP or BiPAP over it, right? Mm -hmm. Most people, especially adults, are going to have big enough nares that we can actually put both in there. And so yeah. that's something I've, I've started doing in my own practice a lot better. Um, I think getting the respiratory therapist to understand the ER. I just had a recent one <clears> where I went to, you know, intubate and they took everything off. I still wanted the nasal cannula to stay in place to provide passive oxygenation during the intubation. But these are things that I've, I've learned from, from being out here. And I would say that the yeah. things that you guys are doing are probably better than some of the things we're seeing in some of the emergency departments. And just trying to get that word out, trying to get more paramedics to come to difficult airway class, especially now that it's local here in Texas, which is yeah. awesome. I, I went to a class in D.C. Uh, obviously, it involves travel, um, but having one local is great. And, and getting some physicians there, too, some ER physicians yeah. to really come understand. And you talked about this blood pressure thing. I think it's important to really, if you really want your patient to end up at 110 systolic, trying to get them 
pre-intubation up to maybe 130 because yeah. no matter what, whether it's a tomidate or ketamine, I wouldn't rely on them giving you any push, right? You yeah. have a, somebody with a sympathetic surge of ketamine, it's probably not going to give you a bump. I think both agents will hopefully keep everything steady, but most times they're going to drop, especially when you mm -hmm. stick a laryngoscope blade in. Yeah. And not only that, the, uh, the effects that positive pressure, when you switch that over, uh, switch that patient over to positive pressure with a VIN or a BVM, it has profound effects on critically ill patients. Uh, but back to the pre-ox, you know, Chris over here was, when he back, when he, when he taught RSI 10 years ago, uh, he really preached pre oxygenation <laughs> Son of a back win, this old dude over here. So. Thanks for sharing, um, he though. really preached pre oxygenation you know, that flush flow rate of nasal cannula, non-rebreather, uh, two NPAs. Um, but I think the biggest downfall to pre oxygenation is the understanding of why we're doing it, right? Like, what's the why? And so it's to increase your safe apnea period, which is defined as the onset of the paralytic to the time the patient desats to 93%, which is critical hypoxia, right? That's the time we have to innovate. So oftentimes our medics are doing this, but then they're rushing the innovation attempt. That's part of the process so you can slow down, mm -hmm. right? So that's the why part of it. So how do you do it? So it's going to be a nasal cannula and always in addition to something something else, right? Your nasal cannula is there for apneic oxygenation, but you put it on early just like Weingart say, uh, says, uh, so you don't have to break the seal to your other device. And so your other device is going to be typically your non-rebreather at flush flow rates. Um, and if you don't know what flush flow rates, I bought this uh, glass flow meter here. And so at 15 liters on a non-rebreather, you get an FiO2 concentration of 65%. There's only two things that will affect oxygenation. That's PEEP and the concentration of oxygen. So by turning this dial up till it stops, you can get an average of 50 to 60 liters per minute of uh, flow out of it, which will get you really close to 100% FiO2. So nasal cannula, non-rebreather at flush flow rates for at least three to five minutes to wash out all that nit nitrogen in your patient's functional residual capacity, right? Which is defined as the remaining volume of gas in your lungs after exhalation. It's roughly 30 mils per kilo of ideal body weight. And so just for an example, like a 70 kilo patient, that's 2,100 mils that we can affect to wash all that nitrogen out. So when that patient does go apneic from the paralytic, your body's still drawing from all that high concentrations of oxygen. And then even when you take that device off, you have that nasal cannula that's left in place during the innovation to provide you with an even bigger buffer. Um, one of these slides that I think you're gonna put on here is the time to desaturation curve. And it, it shows us two really good things. It shows us that with proper pre oxygenation we often have a lot longer to innovate than we think we do, but it also shows us that your oxygen saturations don't fall from 100 to 94 like they do from 93 to 100. Because when you become hypoxic, your, your hemoglobin just kick off oxygen at a rapid pace to help with perfusion. He meant to say 93 to zero. If your patient's not ventilating well, like Dr. Northam was saying, use that CPAP or BiPAP or switch over to BVM. And one of the things that Chris stated, you know, years ago when we were talking about pre-ox is the, the use of the BVM and the increase of gastric insufflation and aspiration. And Weingart's, I, I think, initial definition was without the need for bag mass ventilation because it should be rare. I don't, I don't want to... I hate saying that because I don't want people to get the idea that not to use the BVM. But it's very rare. I can count in my career probably on one hand how many times I've actually had to use a BVM because usually a nasal cannula and non-rebreather at flush flow rates delivering that high concentrations of oxygen will get your patient up to 100%. Yeah. So why don't right? you make sure the listeners understand kind of the poor man's, mm -hmm. right, throw the BVM on but don't bag, right? So you still have mm -hmm. somebody that's ventilating, you've got your nasal cannula on at 15, you've got flush flow with non-rebreather, mm -hmm. and you're still at like 88%, you need a little more, right? So mm -hmm. instead of pulling the BVM and bagging them or pulling the entire CPAP circuit out, mm -hmm. right, you're actually getting about six a peep with your nasal cannula, right? Yep. And then so what you can do is you can just take your BVM, hook it to high flow, and you can put your peep valve on peep of five or 10 and hold the mask over the patient's mouth. They are ventilating still at 14, 16, right? You're providing supplemental oxygen and you're also, when they're breathing out, they're breathing against the peep valve. So you're providing about CPAP of five or six, I think is yep. what we saw, right? You turn up to 10, maybe you're getting about eight because you're not truly getting in and out peep because you're not bagging. Mm -hmm. But that's a really good way to you get them up to 94, 95%. Now we hit our meds. Maybe we've already given a little ketamine if they're an extremist. We hit our paralytic, and then all of a sudden, 
60 seconds is up if we give rock and we're literally just pulling that off we're not pulling a CPAP circuit off right our nasal cannula stays on we're dropping our tube we're taking our our mask off and we're bagging that patient right and so that's yeah. kind of a poor man's way to kind of get us to where we need so yeah. um, no I'm, I'm really glad you said that because i i think that we should probably be doing this on a lot of our patients that have that vq mismatch um, and I did it one one of my last RSIs and I wouldn't really worried. I wasn't worried about them desatting, but I did the apneic BVMC pap like you're talking about just to make sure because they'd already vomited and they'd slightly aspirated. Uh, but I got their oxygen saturations up to hundred percent, but I did the apneic BVMC pap to kind of bridge me through the paralytic to where I could innovate without them falling and they, and they didn't fall. And so, uh, yeah, the apneic BVMC pap is amazing. So tell the listeners too, I see a lot of, um, technique problems with intubating. So if we are using really anything but a Miller DL old school, right? Most people are moving to VL should be really your standard of care. Yeah. Where are we putting the tip of those blades? Where are we putting the tip of that hyperangulated okay. blade or that Mac? Because I see a lot of people with, whether you're using Glidescope or McGrath or King Vision or um, UE, they are getting this amazing like court side to the Lakers game view and they're heading posterior, heading posterior, mm -hmm. right? And so they're really blocking their way. So where should the tip of that ultimately be? And we talked a lot about it with difficult airway. Yeah. It's really changed my practice as well. Yeah. So I'm going to back up just a little bit, and this probably can be pretty controversial, but I think DL blades should probably be thrown in the trash, and we should all be using video Whoa. or scopes, okay? <laughs> Briggs has a tattoo of one, so I don't know if you're okay yeah. with that. I'll have to update um, That was old. And so I'm just going to touch on that a little bit. You know, if, you're, if you are using uh, DL instead of and you had DL, you're wrong like it it's a way of cheating and the biggest thing to failure with uh innovation is the lack of practice right and so vl makes it easy right it's it's cheating and so you're kind of working around a curve but you have standard geometry and you have hyperangulated obviously we use hyperangulated here um huge shout out to chris over here it's made our numbers go through the roof and it takes the difficulty out of innovation um but if you're using a hyperangulated or you're using a MAC blade, it should be in the volecula, right? And I think one of the biggest downfalls to paramedics intubating is they just throw the laryngoscope, the laryngoscope in and pray to God that they see something when they should just be methodically walking down the tongue until you see the epiglottis. If you can see the epiglottis 99% of the time, you should be able to intubate that patient. I would say almost 100%. Right, um, With a Miller, you should be going posterior to the epiglottis and lifting the epiglottis up. Uh, but people that like use the, the UE, you know, it's kind of a standard geometry blade. And what they're doing is they'll go down, they'll get a view, and they're looking at the camera. And with a bougie, they're trying to pass it through the vocal cords. Well, if you're going to use a bougie, you could bend it, right, to kind of shape it. But it's not a for sure thing. The bougie is made for a direct line of sight. So if you're using like a video, uh, video learning scope like the McGrath or the UE, um, it's great that you're looking at the video, but if you're using a bougie in your right hand, you need to be directly looking at the glottic opening. Um, a lot of people don't realize that they're stylets that are made for the shape of the blade so you can use the video. Um, so so yeah, UE just, actually makes a stylet very similar to the Glidescope one. Yes, a absolutely. Rigid one. And so it's almost have, the same one. Yeah, so, and, and then yeah. the other thing that we've learned too is, you know, the, the technique of just putting the tube, kind of like a pencil, right? So mm -hmm. technique we learned at Difficult Airway, especially with the hyperangulated blades, yeah. especially with the rigid stylets now. Yeah. Um, going away from bougie, unless you're using probably McGrath, like you said, mm -hmm. or, or DL, but you know, actually holding it like this, um, yeah. which is way different than we all yeah. learn how to intubate, right? If you ever saw somebody holding it like this, you'd be yeah. like, what are you doing? What are you doing? But that's really the best way. And so, I mean, when yeah. you get the tip of the ET tube, basically through the cord, you're, you're popping the top of, you know, the rigid stylet up, mm -hmm. softening the tip, pushing it in and pulling it out. And a lot of these, obviously, because they're rigid, you have to bend them down this way. You can't pull them, pull them out like a malleable one, but yeah. What's better than a malleable, it's better than a malleable one because the malleable ones, I mean, you start going in there, starts bending, you're not really keeping the form of that tube. And so yeah. that was a that was a big deal for me with difficult airway, obviously, mm -hmm. where to put the um, blade. But we see this amazing view and then we're really frustrated that we keep going posterior, we can't get it in. Yeah. It's really because you're blocking your view with this yes. blade. Yeah, I forgot to touch on that. Yeah, when you get that, you know, great view, oftentimes you are way too close. You're beyond the, the epiglottis right and so when you get that view it skews how much room you have to actually pass the tube and you know he touched on this years ago with using the co-pilot 
Um, that if you had that view, you were way too close, you needed to back out to kind of where you get kind of a backwards, more broad view so you can see everything. You kind of want right. the club seats to the game, right? Yeah. You don't really yeah, want yeah. the court side. The court side, you have an issue, but more the club, more the panoramic view is really what we're supposed to be searching for. But when we do Cadaver Lab, um, I would say majority of medics come in, they throw it in, and, and you know, you're know you somewhere underneath the epiglottis. So you really want to see the epiglottis. You want to hit the, the vertical ligament in the vollecula, and once you touch that, it's like a pulley system. The epiglottis yeah. pops up, and it really gives you the best view. So kind of concentrate on that. I think your numbers will, will go up. Yeah. One one thing I've seen in, in some of the misses that I've that I've witnessed is people just kind of trying to get to the end and then looking around. And one thing that you've done a really yeah. good job of teaching. It's not a methodical is, approach. It's yeah. A, yeah. Just, just throw it in and try to figure things out. Exactly. Like like pay attention to where you're at the whole journey. Like yeah. just okay, I'm at the time. I'm at the time. Okay, because yeah. otherwise you get you get all the way back in there and then you start looking. You're going to be lost yeah. potentially, especially in some people with uh, more difficult anatomy. Yeah. And use your suction, right? I mean, suction should be like the you know, the, the screen is your windshield. It should really be your windshield wipers. And the first time you stick a video scope into a analogy. pool of gastric contents, you're done, yeah. right? So really <laughs> leading as you're going, suctioning as you're going, like the windshield wipers behind a windshield. And once you get to your point, you know, really shove it in the esophagus. Number one, yeah. that's going to hopefully block your esophagus. So if you see a suction there, you shouldn't put your tube there. Number two, any of this kind of passive stuff coming up, hopefully will capture some of that. It's going to give you a higher chance of success. All of this stuff we're talking about, yeah is making you more successful. Just yeah. like when we work, start working CPRs and staying, it became a, a calm scene where it's saying, oh my gosh, I gotta get this IV in this tube and we gotta get going, I gotta get to the hospital. Now it's like, we're going to stay here for 10 minutes. It could be 20 minutes, it could be yeah. 30 minutes, or we may stay here because we didn't get a pulse back, right? And so this is going to set you up for success. So yeah. having SATs of 100% rather than trying to tube at 85%, and for a lot of agencies out there, some of the medics may not get a, a chance at intubating over a course of a year, right? Yep. Um, if you're a slow system, busier system, maybe you get one a year or two a year. So you really have to practice this stuff and set yourself up for success. I think yep. that's what we've, we're really trying to teach. Yeah, that's what we teach in the Dickel area course. You know, the seven P's of RSI, that whole process is to set you up for success, right? So it's not RSI, we, or we tell our guys, it's not RSI if you're not doing all seven P's. Right, because that is the successful part of RSI going in with your suction, pre auction, pre oxygenation, or sorry, pre oxygenation, patient optimization, um, using a video laryngoscope, right? Like to me, it's not RSI if you're not doing those things, right? Because those are the small details that make you successful in airway management. Doing all those is going to keep you calm and relaxed, or should keep you calm and relaxed whenever you get to the intubation part. Right, it's so you can relax now, and you don't have to worry about the patient becoming hypoxic or hypotensive. Right, those are the big killers of RSI, and dramatically affect our mortality rates. And so you got to do all seven of those, and it sets you up for success, and you can just relax. So we've actually changed rapid sequence innovation our protocols to resuscitation sequence innovation. Um, we really don't want people to do it rapidly. We want them to do with resuscitation in mind. And you can talk about DSI, and there's some folks talking about doing DSI for everything. I mean, I think that optimizing your patient is kind of part of DSI, right? Yeah. And if the patient's an extremist, giving a little bit of ketamine, getting your pressure up during that time, getting your SATs up, all of this is kind of a stepwise way to have success. Um, and so we, we've changed the name. It was actually Wheeler's idea. But I think resuscitation sequence innovation is a better name um, than, than rapid. There really shouldn't yeah. be a whole lot of rapid about it. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a huge misconception. You know, uh, people are like, rapid sequence innovation, and everybody interprets that as getting to your patient, rapidly pushing your meds, and innovating. The rapid refers to the rapid push of your meds, right? And so I'm kind of glad that we went to the resuscitation part because it kind of takes that mindset out of, oh, we just need to hurry up and get them innovated, you know, not resuscitate, not pre ox. Um, I so was yeah. on a uh, I was on a call with Mindy and Tyler and Victoria the other day, and we never got to the innovation part of it. Like it, it was one of the I haven't been on a whole lot like that. We were pretty close to the hospital. the The tube was not the the fixing situation. I believe it was a sepsis call, mm -hmm. like peri arrest. Like really, really, it was like we thought he was about to code. Um, checked a pulse multiple times. We're watching in title like a hawk. And we gave multiple push doses of Levo, Epi, hung a drip, gave a whole bunch of fluid, like did everything possible. 
except for intubate because we never got to that marker where, and you know, we're not going to stay there forever until you just have yeah. a stable patient. Yeah. Sometimes you're just not going to have a stable patient, yeah. but we also never pushed the drugs because yeah. we were able to ventilate him. Like yeah. he, well, he was ventilating on his own, but we were able to pre him. We got him pre we got him stabilized. We got to the hospital and we had everything done. We just hadn't intubated. Yeah. And thankfully, um, they were also aware of the situation and they waited about half an hour. Yep. They waited half an hour until the levofed drip was titrated up high enough. The fluids had gotten in there. They'd get done labs. And then they ended up obviously intubating. But it was just like nobody got in a hurry to push those drugs. And yeah. I think, honestly, had we not, had we had a different mindset, maybe we had the mindset we had, you know, a decade ago. Yeah. That guy got, that guy dies. Oh, yeah. Every time. hundred percent. Well, I think we um, underestimate the ketamine as well. I mean, especially for, you know, bronchodilatory effects. We've had, asthma, you know, bad asthmatics. We've had... Um, bad allergic reactions that we're thinking we've got to intubate this we don't want to intubate this asthmatic but we're gonna to have to and literally you're setting them up getting things going optimizing they're an extremist we're, we're giving them a dose of ketamine and all of a sudden it's like wow yeah. this patient's improved their sats are improved their yeah. worker breathing's improved their lungs have cleared up right mm-hmm. we don't have to intubate this patient yeah. and so that's another real big benefit especially in allergic reactions and and um, you know anything with um, bronchoconstriction uh, as well and I think that also focusing on a higher dose of paralytic for your hypotensive patients is important. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there, there was a graph that was sent out, but we we're moving to 1.5 to 2 uh, mg per kg actual body weight for for sucks and rock uh, across the system as well as uh, VEC if we have a shortage. But really moving towards the fact that, you know, it's going to take 60 seconds for rock to work. And if you have a hypotensive patient, it's going to take a whole heck of a lot longer. Yeah. And so you're not going to overdose somebody or you're not going to over paralyze them. So giving them the higher dose, hopefully will have higher circulatory, um, you know, volume of the drug mm-hmm. and hopefully work quicker. I don't want rock to take two minutes to work no. when I've got a patient that needs it. So that's something else we've moved towards as well. Yeah. Um, but- so back on Jeff's part, um, uh, sometimes you're resuscitating for the hospital to debate. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. um, and Lane does a really. He's the other difficult airway that course sucks, instructor. Way, that sucks. To oh no, like, it, do it, all it the, does. Do all the work. Yeah, yeah, do yeah. All the work, and then yeah. they get to do the cool stuff. Yeah, but sometimes you are, especially with like trauma patients who are bleeding out. Sometimes you're giving those two units of blood, uh, PRBCs, that plasma, and they're not ready to be intubated because you know they're going to die if their blood pressure isn't a, at a certain point. So sometimes you are resuscitating for the hospital, and that's a great case. Like you know, even the hospital is going to continue to resuscitate. Mm-hmm. Was that over here? It was right across the okay. street. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, on your point with the paralytic, uh, we where we were kind of getting in trouble at the first the first year is like people were underdosing on their paralytic. Um, and there's a great quote by uh, I think George Kovacs or Scott Weingard. It's Do you know what an overdose of a paralytic looks like? It's paralysis, <laughs> right? An underdose is an airway disaster. Um, and that's why everybody liked succinylcholine initially years ago over rocaronium is because the doses of rocaronium was like 0.6 mix per kg. And so your, your onset time for rocaronium was, you know, a minute and a half or two minutes. So you would give that automatate, which is on in 30 seconds, and then you, your paralytic's not on board for another minute. And so that sedation lag time is not only long, but your patients are hypoventilating. They're de-recruiting. All the bad stuff is happening during this point in time. So, like he's saying, increasing those doses of your paralytic is going to bring that time that time down to where your patient doesn't experience that hypoxia and desaturation during your innovation attempt. So, give high doses, two mix per gig, every single time. Sounds like two hundred. I feel like you're a historian. <laughs> every time you're like was, yeah. back in the day, yeah, right? Yeah, we, we <laughs> when you used to innovate, like, people. Yeah. <laughs> What dose did you give in the seventies? What did the What did the DL look like? Yeah. yeah. No. So on a. North, I maybe know the answer. What is the national success rate for DL for paramedics? Do you know for pre-hospital intubation? I don't know. I can tell you throughout our system, it's all over the place. Yeah. So back in the day, uh, even at uh, when I was when I was flying, um, our success rate with DL was in the seventies. That was the plot surge. That's embarrassing. And that was probably really good compared to others. Uh, but I would say it's sixty to seventies. Oh, Have yeah, you done yeah, that? Yeah. I think no, it's sixty 60s. to seventy. So we're we're on the same page. I agree. I think. Um, it's kind of like iron salts on a. I'm gonna piss a lot of people off on this. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. Like, yeah, iron salts are great. You know, they never fail, but they do sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so what's the like? Why? Why when you have technology with you know red dots and variable power optics and all that stuff? Why would you have iron salts in your arm? Yeah. You just 
There's no point. And yeah, I think everyone says, well, what if my VL goes down? What if the battery's dead? You could say the same thing about deal. What yeah. if my light doesn't yeah. work? How many there, times have you, yeah, yeah, you stuck a, a Miller in and the light shuts off? So, right? and so I mean, that, that's a problem as well. And my thing is, is you're right, it could fail, but you're likely to fail a lot more with the DL than the DL is to fail. So that's why I've never understood the, well, what what if? I mean, we can what if ourselves to death. Well, great, what if what if a video fails? You're right, it's technology, it could. Um, you got you to gotta back up everybody. But personally, a lot of these systems, and, um, and we've had this discussion, but uh, I think your, your backup to a video should be another video. Um, yeah. And then if, again, what happens if both fail? And, you know, <laughs> what are those things that disable bad. all technology? Yeah. You know? Your partner has glued the airway bag shut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chris, no, no yeah, we, I mean, you've got an eye gel. Yeah. Uh, our goal is, you know, and at least a lot of these patients, the vast majority is not, a, not necessarily innovation, but it's oxygenation and ventilation. Um, and you can achieve that with a with an eye gel if your you know seven video range scopes fell yeah. or whatever. I mean, you're putting the difficulty back into innovation. Yeah. I mean, have you ever it's, seen somebody innovate with a DL after doing video for a while? They're shaking. They're right. They're trying to manipulate they're anatomy. Trying to look at the screen. There's, right. no, there's no screen. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know. I mean, but I, I don't know. I think it's a standard to me. Is uh, I think if you if you want to innovate as a service, um, and then you look at national averages of uh, sixty to seventy percent, I think it should be VL. I think oh, no, 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 that, no, 100%. like, well, what happens if we don't VL? Well, we're doing a lot of harm, then maybe you shouldn't be innovating. Yeah. Maybe uh, yeah, you get better at using which the tools you have. Yeah. So I'll give them props because Wheeler probably won't give props, but I mean, this they're at about a ninety-two percent first pass rate with about a ninety-nine percent overall. That's amazing. Um, so they're doing great work. They, it, it takes a lot of work. I mean, they have literally gone through difficult airway class and scenarios with every single person at PCHD over the past few weeks, which takes hours and hours of scenario time. Um, so if, if you want to get your numbers up, it takes work. Um, we're happy if you want to contact us, contact Jeff. We're happy to help you with that process. There's a difficult airway class um, that he and Lane will be putting on. There'll be doctor involvement as well, April 3rd and 4th at UNT HSC. So it should be on our website. I know it's on Best EMS website. In addition, in addition, all the 2024, 2025 class dates have been um, released as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a, a class that is as powerful as this one, that, you know, whether you're a physician, um, a medic, um, even just kind of respiratory therapists and nurses understanding why we're doing what we're doing, right, um, to help make the team better, uh, it's really powerful. And all of those will be out here at Weatherford or Education Building. So highly recommend you come. It's nice, that, uh, especially if you live in Texas, you don't have to travel all the way to D.C. or travel to a different state and put up with all that. But um I uh, highly recommend their, their, their class, and, and I've been through it and been helping them with this as well and learned a lot and was able to take it really back to our ED physicians as well because um, there's definitely work to be done in the emergency department as well. Yeah. Cool. Hey, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us till the end. I know we went over a lot of topics on this one. This is a great example of the content that Wheeler and Lane teach in the Difficult Airway class. So come on down and join us in Weatherford, Texas, if you're listening to this outside of PCHD. Uh, I had the flyer up earlier, and here it is again. But it will also be a link. There will also be a link in the video description, and uh, feel free to reach out to Lane. Uh, you see his email there, if you have any questions. Next episode, we'll be talking about body worn cameras and uh, kind of what it's brought to the table for us. So stay tuned. See y'all next time. This has been an episode of the PCHD EMS podcast. Thank you for joining us.